Good morning. It's Steve from the Fairfield Seventh-day Adventist Church in Southern Illinois. And um, welcome to Text Talks. In the accompanying Sabbath devotional, I talked about some of my personal experiences with depression and the rope that I found that held me alive uh, as I went through the darkness. Uh, in today's text talk, uh, we're going to explore some of what the insights the Bible brings to this subject. But before we dive into the Bible, I want us to look at our frame of reference, the context, the cultural context and the understanding that we bring to this that pr provides a lens as we look at depression. In psychology today, there are four dominant models of depression, ways of looking at depression uh, that guide interventions and expectations and uh, treatment. So uh, starting on the upper left, we have the behavioral model, also called operant conditioning, which uh, emphasizes the impact of external causes on shaping our responses to events in our lives. And this views, um, this views depression as a reaction to, a trained reaction to events in our lives. The psychodynamic view looks at internal causes. This is Freudian psychoanalysis. Um, and it looks at the subconscious impact, uh, the, the impact of the subconscious on our emotions, our thoughts, and our behaviors. The cognitive behavioral model emphasizes mental causes, the twisted thinking that is involved in depression that we observe there. It doesn't, quite, doesn't ask or answer whether that twisted thinking is a result of the depression or the cause of the depression, it just says it is. And it focuses on bringing insight into the twisted patterns of thinking that we have and in uh, emphasizing that we have to act in new ways rather than just think in new ways. The spiritual model, which you find with pastoral counseling, emphasizes spiritual causes. Uh, and I'm not talking just about supernatural spiritual causes. I'm talking about uh, the effects that unresolved guilt and um, those issues bring to the table. But underlying all of these psychological models is an even more dominant model in Western culture, and that's the biochemical model that depression, anxiety, mental illness in general, represents a chemical imbalance in the brain, that the neurotransmitters that make the brain work are out of balance. And we use medications and lifestyle to correct that imbalance. So that's kind of our cultural context. I wanted to just briefly go over that. If you haven't been exposed to some of these, in reality, all of them contribute to our understanding of and treatment of depression when we take a holistic view. Uh, now, there's, there's an aspect of if you got a hammer, every problem's a nail. So if you have a, a if you go to someone for help and they're only trained in the cognitive behavioral model or the psychodynamic model or the spiritual model, you may only get help for those from that model. Uh, it's, it's important to recognize that this is a multifactorial um, condition. So moving on, what does the Bible have to say? Uh, first of all, um, there are examples of people in the Bible who appear to have suffered from depression. When we read the Psalms of David, he talks about darkness and emotional ter turmoil and desperation and despair. He expresses the feelings of, of depression very well. 
And his consistent answer is an appeal to God both to relieve his circumstances, but also to bring hope and joy into his life. In the story of Elijah, after uh, he is fleeing from Jezebel and he's out in the desert, uh, he, he talks about wanting to die. He says, God, take my life because I'm no better than my father's. And God says, uh, here, eat. The journey's too great for you. Now, Jonah also asked to die. But unlike Elijah, who was overwhelmed with the enormity of life, uh, Jonah was more... Well, you see the twisted thinking in Jonah more than anyone else, okay? You see it a little bit with Elijah and David. But Jonah, boy, we can really see twisted thinking. Job, on the other hand, his his expressions of depression uh, are are rooted in the physical illness that he was experiencing and the the loss of his children, the catastrophe that it had had been visited upon him. Jeremiah, he was depressed because of the persecution that he was facing. Um, the the blindness of the people around him as he was warning of this catastrophe that was coming upon his family, his neighbors, his city, his nation. Um, yeah. So you have these five examples, and there are other examples of people who asked to die or who were perceived as struggling emotionally. Okay, uh, but I chose these five, and it's interesting that all of them there's an identifiable cause or, and a cause that we would identify as being the root of their depression. Um, in modern psychology, we call this reactive depression, we're reacting to a circumstance or an event in our lives. Uh, and we oppose that to what we call uh, endogenous uh, depression, depression that appears to have no cause. But I need to emphasize, and my own personal experience bears this out, that very often the reason we don't find a cause is because we're not looking at this as a multifactorial issue. My depression had roots in behavioral issues, had roots in psychodynamic issues, had roots in cognitive behavioral issues, there were spiritual issues. Uh, they all combined, and if I wasn't looking at all four elements, I wouldn't have found the answers that led me out of the constant cycle of the pit. So when we have depression, if we're struggling with depression, what hope does the Bible offer us? Um, to be honest, I just got on the internet and looked for Bible passages related to depression. Okay, I didn't find any Bible studies prepared for this. Most of the Bible studies that I have in the books on my shelf and that I can find are related to beliefs and doctrines rather than dealing with the experiences in our lives. Okay, So I got on the web and I just asked Bible, Bible passages for depression and I found this website that was really interesting. It, it, it had a list of Bible passages that talk about negative emotions and, and things that could be interpreted as depression and then it lets people rank them, not rank them, a vote for them as to whether they were helpful or not. So I just picked the 10 most helpful passages from that website. And it was the, I think it was the first one on the, on the Google list. So you can look it up for yourself to find, because there were like 65 passages there uh, that people had found helpful in dealing with depression. So we're just going to look at the first 10. There's nothing structured about this. I'm not trying to teach you anything. I'm trying to point you to the word. So Psalms 34, David. 
the early psalms are all attributed to David. So that we, with this, we can uh, tie it sometimes to if, uh, incidences in his life. And in my Bible, um, the, the heading of this says, A Psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. Abimelech was a king of the Philistines. And David, when he was persecuted by Saul, fled to the Philistines, who he had been killing in droves. The women of Israel sang, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Now, one man killing ten thousand people is exaggeration, but you get the idea. David was not well liked by the Philistines. And here he is <laughs> coming to the king of the Philistines asking for protection now. Uh, as you can guess, once he was recognized in the court, um, things got pretty dicey. And uh, he ended up faking insanity. And when they thought he was crazy, they threw him out. So this psalm is written, is attributed to having occurred in that context. And we're just going to look at two verses out of it, 17 and 18. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as he, such as be of a contrite spirit. I can tell you, when I was in the throes of depression, I frequently was crying to God. And this passage asserting that God hears and delivers out of our troubles, that served to buttress and reinforce the rope of hope that my own personal experience brought to me. The Lord is nigh unto those who are brokenhearted. Friend, if you're brokenhearted, if you find yourself in a pit of despair at the end of your rope, these words are for you. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. The book of Isaiah is split into two parts. The first, part, first uh, chapters up until the beginning of chapter 40 are an attempt to wake up God's people, to warn them that if they keep going down the path they're going, uh, bad things are going to happen. It's kind of like mom and dad talking to us when we're teenagers. If you keep doing that, you're going to end up in jail. You're going to die if you keep you doing that. Okay, That's the first part of Isaiah. But beginning with, verse, with chapter 40 and the rest of Isaiah, uh, it's assumed that all of the doom and gloom, the judgments that had been prophesied in the first part of Isaiah, have come to pass. And the rest of Isaiah is pointing people to who are in the throes of judgment, doom and gloom, to hope. So, Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. These are words spoken to people who have not listened to God. This addresses one of the primary spiritual roots that depression and anxiety um, can spring from a sense of having been cast off and separated from God because of our guilt, our sin, our fa fallibility, our inability to be who we think we should be. Fear not, for I am with thee. I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. These words were very meaningful to me when I was struggling with depression. 
1 Peter 5, 7. And when I say that, I mean that, okay? These aren't passages that were just meaningful to pe nameless people on the, the internet. I've been a stu student of the Bible my whole life, and every one of these passages that I'm sharing with you, I found meaningful in my life. So 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. The first part of that felt like an impossible command. Casting all your care upon him. But then I saw the second phrase, for he careth for you. Sometimes it's hard for us to believe that God cares for us, especially when we're in depression. The twisted thinking that isolates us and makes us feel alone makes it difficult for us to believe this is a rope to grab onto, to hold onto, okay? Against the evidence even of our own hearts. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Matthew 11, verse 28. The words of Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So often those of us who are religious, when we are in depression, we feel this spiritual burden weighing down on us. If we were really close to God, we'd never feel this way. Okay. Jesus' words to us today are, come to me, just come, and you'll find rest. Powerful, a powerful call. Back to the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. It's interesting how many of these passages that people found helpful in depression are drawn from the Old Testament. If we accept the division of the Bible that certain passages don't apply to Christians and others do, this help would not be available to us. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. This is a prophecy that Jeremiah gave to the Jews. And verse 10, he promises, he promises them that after 70 years of exile in Babylon, he's going to bring them back home. And verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. You know, a lot of times we can look at the circumstances that we're in and we can be pretty hard on ourselves. Uh, with justification, we can see how we contributed to getting to where we are, uh, whether it's through substance abuse, or the way we treated people in our relationships, or our hard-heartedness towards God when he called us to repent from certain behaviors. God was speaking to people who had rejected him and who were suffering the consequences. And he still said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. 
to give you an expected end. It doesn't matter whether we're getting our just desserts or not. We can be in jail for horrible crimes. God still intends peace for us. Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6. Proverbs is largely a book of aphorisms, pithy sayings that make us think. What is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 going to make us think? The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Ah, no, let's go to Proverbs 3, not Proverbs 5. Okay, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I laid me down and slept. I waked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Part of the twisted thinking that takes over our minds in depression is the sense that people are against us, that the world is against us, that God is against us. The passage that I just read from Jeremiah corrects that last thought. This passage, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves around against me round about. Whether you think it's justified to suspect the people around you or not, whether it is justified, God is on your side and he will sustain you. Psalms 143, verses 7 and 8. The latter Psalms were not written by David, most, most of them. Um, they, they were added um, by other psalmists um, later on in history. But this one is attributed to David. Psalms 7 and 8. And let me read, read verse 1 because this is, this is a common experience when we're depressed. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servants. Don't condemn me. For in thy sight no man living can be justified. Now I'm going to skip on to 7 and 8, but the rest of the passage is meaningful. Hear me speedily, O Lord, my spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me, lest I be like them that go down into the pit. This is a euphemism for death. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning. For in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk. For I lift up my soul unto thee. Now I can relate to those words. I have prayed that prayer in many different forms so many times in my life. And friends, I can tell you, there was a morning. Don't give up. He hasn't. Psalms 30, verse 5. For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh for the, in the morning. You may feel like your, your circumstances, your depression is a judgment from God. Even then, we have this promise. He doesn't stay angry forever. Weeping may endure for the night but joy cometh in the morning. Hold on, friends. The morning comes. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. We're back in the New Testament. Philippians 4, chapter 6 and 7. 
be careful worry for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto god and the peace of god which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. One of the keys of resilience is gratitude. When we're depressed, we don't feel thankful. Thankfulness, gratitude is a discipline in life. My wife and I, every night, as we lay in bed, connecting for the last time before we fall asleep, we ask each other, what are you thankful for from today? Not generalities, but specific things that we are thankful for. And you know, no matter how trying the times, or how tired we are, or how difficult the day was mentally, physically, emotionally, we can always find things to be thankful for because we choose to. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your requests be known to God. This doesn't say don't feel bad. It says bring it to God. And bring to God not only your moans and groans, the pain you're in, but discipline yourself to find things to be thankful for in your conversation with God. Because just because we are in difficult times does not mean that God has not worked in our lives. Find things to be thankful for. And the last one, Psalms chapter 23. Do you know what Psalms 23 is? You will remember it if you don't. It's one of my favorites. Probably because my mother made me memorize it as a six-year-old boy. And then we moved from California to New Mexico and I saw sheep every day. That's right, the shepherd's psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Friends, if you're in the pit, and this applies not to just depression, but any of the difficulties that we find ourselves in emotionally and mentally, grief, anxiety. God still loves you. He hasn't given up on you. And he promises you, without a doubt, a certain end. And his thoughts are peace and goodness. Be safe, my friends, be prudent, but above all, look up, and I'll see you next week.